Good afternoon. Welcome to session eight of European Entrepreneurship at Stanford Engineering School. My name is Burton Lee, and I'm the course instructor. Today is the last session of 2015, the end of winter quarter here at Stanford. And we're very pleased to feature our two remaining speakers from Romania and Bulgaria, uh, Max Gervitz from CCC Startups and Christy Badea of Mavenhut Games, who've flown in all the way from Bucharest and Sofia to be with us here today. So thank you, Christy and Max, for coming such a long distance. Um, just a brief overview of Mavenhut Games. So Mavenhut is the second gaming startup we featured in this series, our first being Rovio, Angry Birds, Peter Vestebaca a couple of years ago. Uh, we plan to feature more interesting gaming startups out of Europe because this is an area where Europe leads the United States, leads Silicon Valley in developing uh, new companies with major global customer bases, but also where we can find very interesting examples of European entrepreneurs and founders bootstrapping their companies uh, on the European, Latin American, other market without, without the need for going for angel or venture capital. So it's a very interesting exception to many of the other startups we're seeing ac across Europe. Um, so brief overview of Romania, I will leave it to Christy to say a bit more about the Romanian ecosystem. Uh, Bucharest is the capital uh, with Moldova here on the north, Hungary here, Ukraine, Serbia, Montenegro, and the Black Sea here. And uh, CCC Startups, which is uh, a very new venture fund, investment bank, which is being raised uh, out of Bulgaria. Uh, again, with Romania here to the north, Black Sea, Turkey, Greece, Macedonia, and Serbia. Uh, Christy, tell us about what's going on on the startup scene in Romania and gaming and startup. Cool. Thank, Thank you very you so much. much. I'm just going to use my phone because I actually have a very good impression about myself, so I usually talk a lot about myself, so I really need to keep it under 50 minutes. Um, hi everybody, thanks so much for being with us tonight. Uh, actually this afternoon for me it's tonight because again in Bucharest, Romania where I'm from uh, it's the middle of the night. Uh, today we're gonna talk about uh, what it's like to start a business from, um, um, from Bucharest, Romania. What it's like to start a, more specifically a gaming business. But first of all, before we actually get started, um, I just want to make sure that the guys in the back you can hear me very well so just give me like a thumbs up. Yeah, that's good for the ego as well. Um, perfect. Uh, so before we actually get started, I uh, want to make sure that uh, everybody takes a couple of seconds and thinks very, very hard about the answer to this question. So which is the most popular Windows application? So probably some of you right now would be considering Microsoft Office, one of those applications over there, probably Word. It's solitaire. <coughs> that is correct. So this is the most used Windows application since uh, Windows was launched. And uh, it's actually one of the most played, probably the most played game in the entire world. Um, considering that it was available on every single PC out there, um, probably, I, if I'm not mistaken, from uh, Windows, uh, after Windows 95. So uh, I just want to make sure that by show of hands, uh, is there anybody that doesn't know how to play Solitaire? So there's <laughs> okay, so the purpose of this game is actually to send the cards to the top foundations. So these four foundations over here. It is a puzzle game. It's a very simple game. Uh, if you haven't played it uh, so far, probably you should ask your uh, grandmother because she, pr I'm pretty much know, I'm pretty much sure that she knows the rules of this game. So um, the purpose of this game is actually to send all these cards to the top foundation. And it was a genuinely single player game. It was a single player experience um, right um, before the game was actually launched. So what we have done at Maven Hut uh, is we've taken that experience and transformed it into a multiplayer experience. Uh, this means that right now, for example, this screenshot was taken while I was playing against somebody else uh, in real time. It was the same shuffle, uh, the same layout of the cards and uh, the purpose of the game is to finish before your opponent. It's as simple as that. Nothing complex, exactly what you see in this picture. This game was actually launched in November 2012. And uh, it was, uh, right now it's available on uh, every single major platform. 
It's available on Facebook, on iOS, and Android. And since then, it went from zero to two, 20 million installs. And it was quite an achievement for us, considering that we have gone through a um, very rough period where we actually bootstrap our company, we've raised capital, and I'm going to walk you through the story of Mavenhut in a couple of seconds. But first of all, I bet everybody's wondering who is actually playing this kind of game. So, okay, there are two million, 20 million installs. So what will be like the average demographics of the game? 45% um, of our users are from the United States of America. The average age is uh, 42 years old. Uh, most of them are female. Uh, so 75% of the players are actually female. The rest mainly are from um, Germany, UK, or uh, France, if I'm not mistaken. And I was actually asked to add a picture of uh, one of our players um, in order to get a good understanding what is our core demographic. So I just took like a random player from Alaska. So that, that, <laughs> that would be our, our average player, so a 42 years old um, uh, person from the United States. Now, these are the guys that made it uh, possible. So uh, this is the amazing team of Mavenhut. We are 30 people right now. Everybody is in the Bucharest uh, office. Um, and uh, since inception, which was probably, if I'm not mistaken, in April 2012, we were able to launch four games. I've mentioned Solitaire Arena before. That's mainly because it is our flagship title. Uh, after that, the other three games that we have launched are mainly spin-offs of, um, of the first title. Um, and uh, since then, we actually were able, with uh, a very good understanding of our audience, and uh, also with a lot of A-B testing and everything that we have done, uh, we were able to grow up to uh, the top five Facebook game developers uh, last year. So. Um, everything is happened actually from this nice little city of uh, Bucharest um, in Romania. And this is actually a, v a very cool picture because I wanted to use this picture mainly because next to that bridge are where my parents live. Um, and uh, actually I think 20 years ago was uh, uh, the first time where I kissed a girl. So there's going to be a Q&A session at the end of this session, so make sure guys you ask all the proper questions. Now, um, take these guys as an example. These guys are uh, uh, chilling. They're watching cartoons in our office. This is a uh, picture of our office. We have this cool thing called uh, Pizza Friday, which is happening every Tuesday. And uh, what I'm going to do right now is I'm going to walk you through the story uh, of Mavenhut. So what was life before Mavenhut? I was actually. Uh, uh, a student at the Bucharest University of Economic Studies. I had my bachelor in uh, business management. And uh, back then I uh, needed some cash in order to pay for uh, the expenses um, of my faculty. And one of, one of the things that I did is I've actually got a job at a local e-commerce um, uh, e um, um, site back in Bucharest. And um, one of the cool things that I've learned back in the days, I think that was probably about 10 years ago, was the fact that internet was really growing and uh, everybody, everybody else, so my friends were pretty much working in banks and everything, and then I was the only one working in IT. And um, one of the things that I saw and, I was, uh, and it really hit me is how fast people actually can uh, bring cool products in front of uh, large uh, masses of people. So. Uh, I was a part of um, this e-commerce uh, website for about two years. And after that, uh, I uh, actually started playing a game, which was called The Republic, which as a um, massive multiplayer online game was developed uh, in Bucharest. And that pretty much took about 12 hours, 18 hours of my uh, entire uh, day. Uh, so again, a student that is spending 18 hours playing a game there's a couple of issues there. So what I decided to do is I decided to, since I have already uh, invested so much time in that, playing that specific game, I decided to actually apply for a job there. And uh, it happened um, 
to have some openings and I actually got the a position of a community manager there. Uh, the company grew really fast. So when I joined the company, I think there were like about four of us. And I, when I left the company, we were about 60. Uh, it managed to raise about uh, $3 million in capital and uh, it received so many awards in Europe. After I um, left the Republic, uh, I actually left the Republic mainly to create my own gaming company because again, my ego was getting really big and I thought to myself, oh, I, cannot, I can do better than these guys. Come on, Red. I can, that's, it's so easy to do that. So what I did, I went to a bank and I took a loan, a personal loan in order to start my own gaming company. Um, I've done that for probably about one year, one year or so. Things didn't work very well for me. Uh, that gaming company didn't took off. Uh, there was pretty much nobody playing one of any of our games. So uh, what I decided to do is uh, come and think like really, really, uh, to take a really tough decision regarding my life. So I thought to myself, so I'm really good at building games. I'm not necessarily very good at bringing those games to market. So what I did is uh, I decided to apply for a job in Berlin at the biggest gaming publisher uh, back in the days called Blinga. Blinga. And uh, I stayed there for, um, I think, half a year. And uh, while I was in Berlin, there was this guy over here. So Bobby, say hello to everybody. Hello. Uh, <laughs> he gave me a call and say, hey, dude, there's this cool business accelerator in Dublin. We should apply for it. Obviously, I said, yeah, sure, let's go ahead. <laughs> I mean, we, I just barely lost pretty much all my money in other gaming companies before, so why not? So that was the early days of Maven Hut. We actually started Maven Hut in Dublin in 2012 at the Startup Bootcamp uh, Business Accelerator. So how a business accelerator works um, is pretty much uh, the standard way. So there are uh, a, bunch, a bunch of teams. I think uh, in our cohort of teams, there were about 10 teams that joined the accelerator. Uh, we got um, three months of uh, mentoring. We were meeting with uh, potential investors, with mentors, with um, uh, clients. For example, some of the businesses that are more B2B, they were also meeting with potential clients. And that thing happened for uh, three months. At the end of the program, we had a demo day. So the demo day, we would come in front of uh, a large audience. Uh, and in the first row, there will be a couple of, uh, there will actually be a dozens of investors that are interested in companies, in early stage companies. Um, and we would pitch the progress of our company in the past, uh, uh, in the past three months. So when we, when we joined uh, startup Bootcamp, we pretty much had nothing but a concept. We had an amazing team, so it was myself, Bobby, and one uh, uh, other guy who has like the coolest name in the world. He's called Elvis, he's like, that's like his real name, and he's an engineer. Um, and the three of us uh, started, uh, back, back then, started creating uh, games that would allow people to play against each other. Mm -hmm. And we thought to ourselves, okay, what is the most played game in the world that Right now, nobody uh, plays it together with their friends. And Solitaire, of course, uh, made it to the short list. We've, cr we've created Solitaire uh, Arena in just a couple, of, uh, a couple of days. We brought it to market. It was a very, very bad product, very bad experience. You weren't able to play it in some of the, um, in some of the browsers, for example, Internet Explorer. Uh, but the guys that were able to actually play that game were really enjoying it and they were coming back the second day. So uh, back then we had a secondary retention uh, of about 40%. So it means that four out of uh, 10 people that played the game uh, earlier, um, they came back for, for a second session, which is quite huge for us, considering that we already knew the numbers, the industry standard numbers. Uh, and it was way above everything that we have experienced. So, I need you to take a moment and imagine what was our uh, situation back then. Uh, we've pretty much put all our um, economies into this. We were uh, away from home, we were in Dublin. Uh, we had a product that is starting to get like, some really good traction, but we didn't have, of course, an investment in, the, in order to build upon that traction. So what we did is uh, we decided to uh, come back to Romania 
mainly because we decided, uh, mainly, mainly be, the main reason behind this decision was uh, the fact that most of the engineers that we know are uh, in Bucharest, Romania. They are the guys, they are the guys that we actually worked with in um, our previous companies. And second of all, is, uh, it was a tough decision for us, but it was uh, one of the best decisions that we ever took because we actually cut down on our costs. So it was, we were able with pretty much no investment whatsoever to uh, increase our run rate. So we spent one summer in uh, one of the bedrooms of uh, the third co-founder of, uh, and it was probably one of the toughest summers that we have ever experienced. Mainly because we uh, didn't have any cash in our, on our head. We were barely uh, get, living from one day to another. We had the product that was growing every single day. We didn't make any money out of it uh, because it was just in the very early days. Um, and nowadays when I think about it, I still get like a very, I, I, it's, it's, I don't want to think about it anymore. So I'm just going to go uh, to the next slide when, it's, when things started getting serious. So that happened in um, fall 2012. So again, we had a rough summer. Um, the game was already picking up. Uh, we probably hit about uh, 10,000 daily active users. And what we decided to do then is we decided to uh, actually put more emphasis on uh, monetizing that audience rather than growing that audience. And while this was a bad decision and a good decision uh, um, whatsoever, the main, the main reason why it was a bad decision was because we actually kept the growth, the good decision in that we started to get some cash. And I'm going to make um, a comparison between Silicon Valley, what, what I see here in the States and Europe. Mainly, if you want to get funded in Europe, and especially in um, an Eastern European country, you actually have to show like huge traction. And uh, it's very important to show some sales, like very early, in the very early days. Otherwise, um, people are not taking you seriously. So yes, you're going to have some growth. You're going to show the big numbers saying, oh, you, we are growing uh, uh, by, um, by two digits every single week. But are you making any money? So that's when was, uh, that was the main reason why we decided to focus on uh, monetizing our audience. We started getting some cash in, and um, that's when we actually got an investment. Uh, the investment back then was at about uh, $700,000, and it came from uh, SOS Ventures. So again, try to, put us, uh, try, try to think about it uh, from our perspective. So uh, we went from nothing. Right now we have something going on. We didn't necessarily knew exactly what, but it was getting some traction. We got some cash on our hand, so we started to take it to the next level. So things were getting really serious for us. And since then, everything started to move very, very in a very, very interesting di direction for us, mainly because uh, uh, we started getting more traction, started getting more users. Now we had the cash on our, on our hand that made us focus uh, a bit more on um, a bit more on uh, on the monetization and on the economy of the game. And uh, after, it was a matter of a uh, month before we started to get uh, a profitable business. So where is Maven Hut today? Maven Hut right now is um, a 30 people uh, company. Most of them are uh, engineers. The other guys are, uh, they don't have necessarily um, something, what would, would you call it a special, um, a, an exact job in the company, mainly because they're doing more or less product related stuff. And I'm going to spend some time explaining why is that. So our main challenges is uh, to find guys uh, that actually help us take, a, take this um, company to the next level. The only problem that we have here is uh, that we don't necessarily find the talent uh, that has done something like this before. So we are sort of in uncharted waters. And let me explain why is that. Uh, for example, here, if you're trying to build a um, social gaming company, it will be very easy to find the expertise in other companies like uh, Zynga or uh, uh, EA. 
uh, in Romania, you don't necessarily have that expertise. And that's mainly because nobody went that, uh, to, the, to the stage that we are right now. So our main <coughs> challenge right now is sort of related to talent. Uh, we're lacking uh, expertise when it, com when it comes to uh, specific problems. We know that we, have, we are dealing with problems that other guys have dealt with before, uh, but it's really hard to bring the expertise to our country and um, help them um, uh, put them in the right position to solve these kind of problems. And also, another problem that we have, another challenge that we have, is the fact, is the fact that we don't think big. So uh, there were moments while we were growing this company, so we went from zero to 20 million installs, and there were moments like when once we reach 5 million, we're like setting ourselves as a target, like, okay, let's go and reach 10 million, and that, that's pretty much it. I don't think that we're gonna grow any more than that. And it kept getting bigger and bigger. So um, there was a cap when it comes to our mindset, but we're trying, we are aware of that, and we're trying every single day to um, actually uh, go for the next level. Now, uh, I'm gonna spend uh, the final, I think I, s I actually have a couple of more minutes. So I'm gonna spend the last part of my presentation to talk about Romania. Mainly Romania is the country between Germany and Russia. <laughs> and that says a lot about the history of our uh, country. Uh, and. Um, as for the ecosystem in our country, um, there are a few activists, I give you that, uh, especially in the past couple of years. Unfortunately, there are no angel investors, or, well, actually there are a few, but I really want them to feel like really offended because they are not very active. Um, and uh, it's extremely tough to raise capital. So what you see is mainly our story. So there's like these smart little guys that are uh, think they are onto something and uh, what they do is they apply for an accelerator in uh, Eastern Europe or even in Bulgaria, how Max is going to tell you about it later. Uh, they're a part of that accelerator, they either going to stay there or they're going to come back for in Romania and continue their building their uh, startup. But being in Romania and raising capital from Romania is extremely hard. And um, that would be the number one challenge that entrepreneurs right now, especially tech entrepreneurs in Romania, are facing. As, uh, there's also some really amazing good sides of the story when it comes to Romania. So there are some huge R&D centers. Uh, in gaming only, there's Ubisoft, Gameloft, EA, King. I think there are more than 5,000 employees working in gaming alone. Uh, there's Oracle with more than uh, 5,000 employees in Bucharest. There's HP, IBM, you name it. Pretty much everybody's go Adobe. Adobe, so yeah, thanks, Bobby. Uh, Adobe, so everybody, every single big guy that you can think from uh, Silicon Valley has an R&D uh, center in Bucharest, which is really awesome because you have, you're, you're gonna get some really uh, great technical guys the v at a price which is quite reasonable for what they can deliver. Entrepreneurship, when it comes to technology, it's in a very early stage. It's starting to get, uh, it's starting to get cooler and cooler by every uh, by every single um, uh, year. But unfortunately, we're not there yet. So what we what you see is uh, uh, you see like some really smart folks that are leaving Romania to start their companies um, in the United States or in Canada or in Ireland. Um, but we don't necessarily see a lot of exits, mainly because it's in a very early stage. Nevertheless, we do have a couple of exits that I want to mention. They are the guys from Avagate and LifeRail. So the guys from Avagate sold uh, their company in 2000, uh, late 2013. Uh, actually, I think they closed the deal in 2014. They've um, sold the company to Francisco Partners, and uh, it was a business built in, uh, in the early days it was built entirely from Rom Bucharest, Romania. The second, um, company is called LifeRail. It was a company acquired by Facebook for uh, $450 million. Uh, I think it was last year. And the guys, uh, the technical guys were from Cluj. Um, so one of the co-founders was actually from Cluj, uh, which, was a city, which is a city in Transylvania. And half of the team was in Cluj when Facebook acquired the company. I think that would be all in a nutshell when it comes to what's happening in Romania uh, right now in terms of uh, technology. 
So um, that's my uh, email address. Feel free to drop any line if you have any further questions. And I think we have a QA session now. Yep. Thank you, Christy. <laughs> questions for Christy? Yes, Val. Okay. Um, I was running an office, development office in Bucharest during that conference. Everything changed. So my question is, uh, your team, Turkey, mostly engineers, do they believe in the equity of the company? Do you pay them uh, high top salaries comparable to this in the enterprise, large enterprise in Romania? Do you pay them regular salaries, motivate them with equity? Okay, so I'm gonna repeat that question. Um, I was asked if uh, the guys from our team are, what is their salary level? Is it uh, uh, somewhere in line with other corporations where? Motivation, do they believe in equity? Okay, um, first of all, I'm gonna just answer how we're gonna do, how we're gonna treat uh, somebody that is coming for an interview. So we want to put the financials and we wanna get rid of them as soon as possible. So we're, what I'm gonna do is try to motivate you with probably about 20% or even 30% uh, more than what you would get on the market. Other than that, when it comes to the, um, pr I think you're wondering more of the employee stock option plan or something like this. Uh, we didn't see any good feedback when it comes to uh, a stock option plan in Romania. People would be more, I think, we are more interested in getting a 10% or a 15% raise rather than being a part of this uh, stock option plan. Mainly, if I would have to find an, a reason behind this, it would be because there weren't so many exits, there weren't ma so many examples. So my friend didn't buy a house because his company that he used to work for sold for a big, uh, for a large uh, sum of money. Uh, but cash plays a very important uh, factor in motivating uh, people. Yes. So, Christy, I have a question to you. Um, I am watching and I'm a member of this Romanian entrepreneur community too. Did you see a fundamental change happening one year ago? So in my opinion, something happened, we changed totally the picture of Romania about one year ago. Uh, about one year ago. If you, so the question was if I saw something specifically in Romania that changed fundamentally the, um, uh, th the way things worked there yeah. one year ago. George, are you referring to the startup community or the political startup environment? Community. Okay, around startups. Okay, okay. I was thinking about the political as well. Uh, in terms of startup, we saw an increase of quality of the people that get involved in uh, a startup uh, community every single uh, year. It's hard to pinpoint exactly last year, uh, but I would say that probably in the past couple of years there was uh, a much better understanding what the startup means. It's a much better understanding of uh, how you can raise capital, why you need to raise capital. Um, I couldn't say that last year was um, a, an important milestone, except for the uh, the two uh, large acquisitions. There was an also an exit. So probably by the time you will see a couple of exits happening, you'll get people more interested in the startup company. Does this answer to your, is, does this answer your question or? Did you have something specific in mind, George? So I can see that for the Romanian uh, community of entrepreneurs, a few milestones which happened in, the, in time. I think the first was the acquisition of GCAT. Yeah. Which will change the mentality. Don't do outsourcing. Let's try to have good exit. So GCAT was one of them. What, that what year was that? 2004. Microsoft bought the 2004. 2004. So yeah. 10 years ago. 2004. That was, I think, I consider that the first first milestone. Definitely, <coughs> Mavenhut is one of the uh, samples that the Romanians know about. I think Samify was another important <coughs> so just to, of Samify by So just to get everybody on the same page, Samify was uh, a company founded by uh, three Romanians that went to a business accelerator in uh, yeah. Vancouver, in Canada. Uh, they, uh, it was um, an acquisition made by Twitter, I think about two years after they founded the company. Cool. Questions? So I, uh, yes, sir. Uh, I am uh, an entrepreneur from, uh, from the 
Ash, and uh, I just wanted to get your feedback, Christy, on uh, how do you see the, the quality of the chemical people in Cluj, Yard, and the rest? Um, okay, so the question was, uh, how do I see the, technic the qualities of the tech guys from different cities of uh, Romania? Uh, more or less, I haven't got any specific contacts with uh, people outside of Bucharest. I know there are, um, if I would have to mention three hubs, it would be the three, uh, one, uh, the three cities that you've mentioned. So it was Bucharest, Cluj, and Yash. Um, I know that Cluj is growing really fast, and they have probably more uh, actually, last year they have more um, successful stories than Bucharest uh, had. Um, it's hard to say that the guys from Bucharest are better than the guys from Yash. It's so hard to bring everybody to on the same page and say, okay, this guy is performing better than the other one. Uh, I think there are so many things involved from um, business opportunities, from strategic decisions, from so many on so many levels. It would be really hard to say, okay, these guys are better than the others. There's a question here as well. Yes. What are your plans for the next year, your personal goals? Okay. Uh, become a millionaire. Hopefully. Become a millionaire <laughs> from <laughs> co founder Bobby. Okay. So my co-founder answered for me. I become a millionaire. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Hopefully not Romanian, yeah. Uh, so the question was, what are my personal plans for the next year? Right now, I'm 100% uh, involved in Mavenhut, and uh, my plans are on the same line with what Mavenhut is going to do for the next year. So I'm going to say um, what's our plan for Mavenhut for the next uh, year or so. Mainly, uh, I think we uh, are still on to something, something really big. These are the solitaire um, card games that I have just mentioned to you earlier. We're trying to consolidate as much as possible and trying to get a huge chunk of the uh, of this market when it comes to uh, solitaire games. We're the pretty much the only solitaire game out there that um, um, with that specific mechanic that uh, is enjoyed by uh, more than uh, 20 million players. So we want to grow that user base. Uh, nevertheless, we are a gaming company, so we need to think about what's next. Um, I would say that uh, for us, ma our main focus is finding the uh, proper talent to take us to the next level. Uh, and I'm going to give you an example why is that. The guy who is responsible for 70% of our revenue, so the product guy for Soita Arena, is, uh, used to be our PR guy. The guy who is responsible for the rest, the 30% of our revenues, was our HR guy. So we don't necessarily have like specific talent that we can snatch from other companies. We just have to grow them internally. And that will be our main challenge. Does this answer your question? Thanks, cool. OK. Uh, sorry, we have to move on to Max. We're going to bring Christy back up again at the end for a joint Q&A with Max and Christy. Let's give Christy a hand. <laughs> so now we're going to move to Bulgaria, so we're moving south. Uh, before we do that, just one little point about Christie's talk and Romania. You, you heard him mention Dublin as being a very important place where they initially kicked off Maven Hut. So Dublin and London uh, are quite important for Eastern European companies as a place to jump to for capital, but also for offices, for, for a legal environment in Europe where they can incorporate, uh, set up customer support, back-end back -end operations. So you'll see a lot of this pattern of Eastern, Southeastern Europe uh, startups going to London, finding talent, getting ideas, making relationships. Also Dublin, Dublin's becoming increasingly important, and Berlin, of course. So now we're moving to, so now we're moving to Bulgaria. So I met Max uh, about a year and a half ago when we had our first speaker, Vasil uh, Terziev, who's the founder CEO of Telerik. Uh, Telerik actually went public last fall for $220 million. So it was one of the biggest exits, maybe the biggest exit in Bulgaria's history. In okay, in CE. Uh, so we're very pleased to follow up with the se our second founder uh, out of Bulgaria. But Max is going to focus on the venture capital uh, fund that he's raising along with Vitaly. Where's Vitaly Golom? Yes, who was our speaker, one of our speakers in our Ukraine and Russia section. Max, tell us what's going on in Bulgaria. Thank you for coming all the way from Sofia. Thank you. Thanks. 
Thank you, Burton. Thanks, everyone, uh, for coming out. I see a lot of familiar faces in the room, so it's very, uh, very good to be back at Stanford and to see many of you here. Um, someone just mentioned that we're going to go south. Uh, we're, trying to go, we're going to try to go south without heading south, actually. Um, so a little bit about me. Uh, my name is Max Gurvitz. Um, I'm not originally Bulgarian, although a lot of people uh, nowadays say that I, I might just as well be one. Um, I was born in Russia. I grew up in the United States and in the Netherlands. Um, I've moved to Bulgaria about four years ago. Um, before that, I founded an online legal services company in the Netherlands, uh, which is uh, in English unpronounceably called Rechelis Um <laughs> It got partly acquired in 2011. Uh, what we were doing was um, online services for, for small companies, very much like LegalZoom or Rocket Lawyer do um, in the United States. Um, back then in, in Holland or in Western Europe, actually, almost no one, almost no one actually did that. Um, and after coming to Bulgaria, I got the opportunity to uh, be on the founding team of a seed fund and an accelerator called Eleven, uh, which was a fund um, um, provided with, with funds provided by the government, uh, by the European Union, but I will, I will come to back to that later. Um, and most recently, um, we've been uh, setting up an, an angel investment company together with uh, one of my Bulgarian partners, Ivan, who's here um, uh, called, un, under the Terrace brand, um, after which um, I moved on to, to, um, to create a new venture capital company for the entire Eastern European and Middle East region uh, called CCC Startups. And a part of that is uh, the series of uh, really cool startup events that we do called Startup Adventure. Now, um, just for your understanding, for those of you that don't know where Bulgaria is and what it is, um, it is a small country in southeastern Europe. Um, it is bordered, as you can see, by, uh, by Romania um, uh, from the north, Serbia, Macedonia in the west, Greece we have in the south, and Turkey in the southeast. Um, it's uh, about the size of Iowa, I would say, in terms of, in terms of land mass. Um, notable facts about Bulgaria, very little. Um, it is, uh, there are seven million people living in Bulgaria right now. Um, with about seven and a half thousand uh, dollars per capita, it has uh, some of the lowest GDP in Europe. Um, it is actually, I think, officially the poorest country in the European Union, uh, which, is, which is also one of its biggest, biggest bragging rights. Uh, Bulgaria, together with Romania, became the 26th and 27th member of the European Union in 2007. And a lot of the progress uh, that is happening in Bulgaria and a lot of the progress that I'll be talking about today is actually thanks to that fact. Um, one of the things for you, for those of you that haven't been in Bulgaria, it's a very beautiful country to visit. Uh, for me personally, it's definitely one of the most pretty countries that I've ever been to and probably the prettiest country that I've ever lived in. Um, it has a beautiful seaside, 220 kilometers of uh, pristine Black Sea beaches. Um, it has some of the hi highest mountains in Europe, actually the highest mountains between the Alps and the Caucasus uh, ranges, uh, which you can see on the, on the photos, the real, the real mountains, the Pyrenean Mountains, and the capital, Sofia, is actually located in the mountains. You can actually go up and ski uh, by public transport from the downtown, which is something very rare for, for most capital cities anywhere in the world. Um, when we talk about tech heritage, Bulgarians are very proud of, uh, of a couple of things. Now, uh, f first and foremost, of kind of a funny thing, um, the founder of the Atanasov Berry computer, John Atanasov, uh, was of Bulgarian heritage. Actually, his dad, he was born in New York, he grew up in Pennsylvania, uh, worked in the Midwest most of his life, but his dad was a refugee as a kid from Bulgaria. Uh, so they gave him this Bulga very Bulgarian surname, Atanasov, uh, which funnily enough also uh, in Bulgaria was picked up uh, as, some, as, as, a part, as, you know, as an item of national pride. So in Bulgaria, a lot of people are actually convinced that a Bulgarian invented the computer. Uh, in downtown Sofia, there is a statue uh, to John Atanasov right outside my former office. Um, uh, I, I guess it's a good thing. It's, he's not a really Bulgarian, but, um, but it's a good thing for Bulgaria to have that as an example. Um, if we move on to more serious stuff, um, yesterday when we were looking at together with Burton at the slides, Burton asked me, why do you put photos of old Macs in your slide? Um, these computers are actually not Macs. These are Provitz computers, uh, which to probably to a high degree were copycatted from Macs, uh, but were some of the very few computers produced in the Eastern Bloc um, in the Soviet era. And that whole manufacturing um, and that whole industry, computer industry, was actually in Bulgaria uh, during the 70s and the 80s. Um, lastly, one of the things that Bulgaria really stood out in, in the last, uh, actually in the last couple of decades already, um, is the fact that in math and computer science Olympics, uh, Bulgarians usually take up some of the top spots. So I think that about a third of all uh, math and computer science Olympiad winners are uh, Bulgarians. So here we see a couple of those guys uh, at a presidential reception in Sofia wearing similar suits and enjoying some, <laughs> some orange juice. Um, if, if, we, if we look at the entire timeline of what has happened in Bulgaria over the last decades, um, in the 70s and the 80s, a decision was taken by the Bulgarian communist government with a very strong support and uh, encouragement, if we put it that, that way, uh, by the Soviet Union to create a cluster of IT companies. Uh, several uh, computer science institutes were founded in, in Sofia and in other Bulgarian cities. 
Um, several production facilities were created, like the one that created the, the Mac, copycats, the private computers. Um, and about 15, even probably up to 20,000 people were actually employed in the computer science industry uh, back then in Bulgaria. And that actually gave a first big impulse to the development of those skills in, uh, in Bulgaria. Um, in 1987, however, things started to change. Uh, this photo that you see over here uh, is a photo of the visit of uh, General Secretary Gorbachev to Sofia in 1987. Uh, this was uh, every time that a Soviet leader would come to Bulgaria and you know, life would come to, to a standstill. Uh, however, in 1987, Gorbachev came to Sofia with a pretty bad message, or actually a good one if you look at it historically. He said, you know guys, this is it. Uh, you're on your own. You know, don't count on us for money and do whatever you want. Um, and the Bulgarian-Soviet friendship was pretty much over, as was the financing and the, the leadership or the stewardship of the computer industry in Bulgaria. Uh, what happened afterwards was actually uh, quite sad for, for, for a while, for, for, for a certain period of time. Uh, big time crisis. Um, uh, Bulgarian, uh, the Bulgarian economy basically grinded to a standstill. Uh, the Bulgarian GDP lost, uh, lost approximately a third in that period. And what is probably most notably what started happening is that people started leaving the country. So if we look at this graph, at the very top in um, at the late 80s, you see that Bulgaria had 9 million people, uh, mostly high educated, uh, virtually, no, um, um, virtually no literacy. Um, as the communist regime faded away, uh, over 2 million people, or almost actually, according to this graph, almost 2 million people, 1.5 million people uh, left Bulgaria. Um, if you look at what kind of people left Bulgaria, uh, you will see that in the, early, in the early part, in the 90s, so these are the blue, the blue graphs over here, uh, those were mostly highly educated people and they actually left to countries like the United States, um, like Germany, France, and other Western European countries. The, later on, uh, what was happening in the 2000s, those were mostly less educated workers that were going to European countries for seasonal jobs. But in the 1990s, Bulgaria lost a lot of its technology potential, and if you look if you look around here in Silicon Valley or in New, you know, New York and other places, you actually see a lot of people of Bulgarian heritage, some of them are here today, the people that were born in Bulgaria, grew up there, that actually um, are very active in the computer science uh, field, in the startup industry, but not in, uh, not in Bulgaria proper. Um, the good thing about what was happening um, during this wave of immigrants um, was that people uh, started at some point sending IT work back to Bulgaria. So in the, in the, in the 1990s, uh, this started happening on a small scale. Uh, small IT shops were being founded with, mostly with doing outsourcing for friends and family and you know, business associates, uh, very often of Bulgarian, uh, of Bulgarian heritage, that were in the United States or in Western Europe. And this industry has, started, has been growing exponentially pretty much since. Um, you can see that over the last 10 years, it has grown by, 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 by 300%. Um, also, the number of people occupied in jobs is probably pretty much back today at the level that it was at the height of the socialist, um, socialist IT boom in the 70s and 80s with about 17,000 people employed in, um, in, in high value added jobs in the IT industry. Um, sure enough, this has also led to, uh, to a number of, um, of company successes and exits. Um, apart from the outsourcing companies uh, that have been created and several greenfield outsourcing outfits that have been set up in Bulgaria, uh, several homegrown companies um, with doing products uh, became big and got acquired on the, on the domestic market um, in, the late in the late 2000s. Um, two very notable examples was Jet Finance, was a company that did um, microcrediting and uh, consumer credits with a very strong IT back end, which was acquired for 200 million euros by, uh, by BNP Paribas in, uh, in 2007. And then in 2008, a local media company called NetInfo got acquired by a Dutch Finnish group called Sanoma, uh, leading to another large exit of approximately 30 million euros. Um, more excitingly, actually, that starting 2009, we have seen more and more uh, international exits in Bulgaria. There's still a few. These are just actually three, maybe out of, out of five or six that happened. Uh, these are the ones that are mostly, mostly interesting to mention. So Scient was a company, it was a Bulgarian company where they hired an American CEO who turned it around and helped, um, helped it execute an acquisition uh, by, uh, by VMware. Uh, today VMware actually has an office in Sofia employing 400 people. Um, so th that story continued on uh, after, the, uh, after the acquisition. Uh, Instinctive was, a, was another company that was, was actually founded by an American with Bulgarian engineers that got acquired in 2012 by SoundCloud. Uh, for uh, for, for not, not a very big amount, it was about $50 million, but still in Bulgaria, that is a, that is a pretty big acquisition. Um, and of course, as Burton already mentioned during the beginning of the talk, the really, really big story of the last five months is that uh, Telerik, or Telerik as it's known in the United States, uh, was acquired by Progress Software, um, a New York Stock Exchange listed company based in Walton, Massachusetts, uh, for, for, an amount, for 
262 million US dollars. Um, and that story kind of clouded everything else because um, uh, it's, it eclipsed basically everything else that's been going on. And in the region right now, um, this is the largest IT acquisition of a company founded by, uh, by local founders in Central and Eastern Europe. Um, we, we make jokes about it in, in Bulgaria. Uh, there, there, there are all these you know, unicorn discussions right now of what is a unicorn. In Bulgaria, we joke that uh, because of you know, $260 million, it's a quarter unicorn, uh, <laughs> the acquisition of Telerik. Uh, but sure enough, it has created a lot of, um, if you can say, positive confusion in Bulgaria. We definitely expect a lot of the people um, that were doing things with Telerik to come back to Bulgaria to start um, reinvesting in the country, helping local founders, et cetera. So it will be, it will be pretty interesting journey going forward. Um, now, very interestingly, if we look at the funding landscape in Bulgaria, uh, it really stands out. Uh, Christy already before me mentioned that in Romania there isn't much of a funding scene, and this is pretty much true for most, uh, for most countries in southeastern Europe and the Balkans. So if you look at Serbia, if you look at Croatia, if you look even at Greece, which nominally is not an Eastern European country, but it's right next to Bulgaria, uh, you, you, won't see a lot of, um, you won't see a lot of investment activity. Usually there is one and a half sort of active angel group around. Sometimes there is a venture fund, uh, which doesn't do many early stage deals. Um, in Bulgaria, actually, we've been pretty lucky over the last um, less than 10 years, actually, five years or so, to have a pretty, uh, pretty active funding scene. Um, there was a fund, uh, it was a private fund called Nevek, which was set up in 2007 with 20 million, uh, 20 million euros. And after that, there was a cascade of funds uh, set up through European Union f funding. One of them was 11, uh, in which I participated. Uh, it's a seed fund with an accelerated program. Another one is Launch Hub. Uh, today with us, we have one or two, act two actually, as far as I can see, uh, uh, founders of uh, MST companies of Launch Hub. Um, and uh, most recently, two co-investment funds were set up for, um, for investments in a, in a more mature stage uh, called Empower Capital and Black Peak Capital. Um, so, you know, recapping, if you look at the entire venture activity in Bulgaria over the last, uh, over the last several years, uh, these are the hard numbers. Uh, on a positive note, 110 companies, uh, more or less, might be two, two, two or three more or less, uh, got investments um, in Bulgaria. A total of 80 million euros were invested with approximately 10 million euros remaining in those funds that I just mentioned. Um, two thirds of that total amount was actually public funding through the European Union uh, designed to kickstart uh, a venture ecosystem. Um, one thing that I'm very proud of personally myself and I've, I've been lucky enough to have a hand in is that about a third of those founders that we invested in in Bulgaria um, are actually not locals. Um, we've invested in, in, in founders uh, from Romania, as Christy already mentioned. We had founders from Serbia, we had founders from Armenia coming in, uh, from, uh, from Turkey, from many other places across the region. And that has definitely given, uh, given the Bulgarian um, startup community a strong boost. Um, on a somewhat less positive note, we haven't seen uh, significant exits so far. Uh, a couple of companies were acquired at investment value, which is, you know, you can call a nice, you know, probably um, aqua hire for, for some of those founders, but we haven't seen any major venture returns based on this venture, venture activity that we've seen. Uh, maybe apart from a couple of angels that did well, a uh, couple of stories that I know personally, but uh, generally the venture funds have not yet been giving back returns. And it's a big discussion, uh, both in Bulgaria and in Europe, whether you know, it's a good thing, it's, is, it, is it the right thing, or are we lagging behind? Um, you, you would ask, why is that? A couple of uh, very strong challenges um, still exist in, in the Bulgarian venture, venture community. Uh, one of the really hard things is to attract talent. So uh, Bulgaria doesn't really have a market for technology. It's a very small uh, market. Uh, you know, if you look, look how the Bulgarian market looks like, it's uh, internet penetration is below average in European levels. Smartphone penetration is below average. Uh, credit card penetration is catastrophic in Bulgaria. People still pay cash and don't actually trust the banking system, which is a typical post-socialist situation that you see in Russia and Ukraine and all the other former socialist countries and Soviet republics. Um, and as I already mentioned in the beginning, the per capita GDP is embarrassingly low for, for a Western Euro well, European Union member state. Uh, so because of these things, we don't have a market. Consequently, there, there is no talent to serve that market. So if we look at the kind of talent we have in Bulgaria, we have a lot of people with strong exe you know, execution technical skills, people that can actually you know, code specifications if you give it to them. But we have very few people that can do um, independent ar architecture of technology and very few people that can actually do the business part. So the product part, the marketing part, the business development, the sales. This is, this is a still a big challenge. Um, another thing is that, as you already saw, most of the funding in Bulgaria at this moment is government, uh, government mandated. So what we, what we have is uh, uh, generally a lack of proper investor incentives because it's basically the government paying for it. And if you look at the CVs of people running funds in Bulgaria, 
Um, they're very well-intentioned and often highly, highly qualified people, but very often without the necessary track record in venture investments. Um, now, what the Bulgarian market doesn't have, I already mentioned this, uh, the business development skills. Um, some of the things we're lacking in Bulgaria are the following. We don't have research. Uh, you know, once again, if you look back at the communist, at the communist days in the 70s and 80s, um, there, was, there was a push from the Soviet Union to invest in science in Bulgaria. Facilities were built, uh, scientific research institutes were built, uh, even a, um, optical, uh, an optical observatory, astronomical observatory was built in the Bulgarian mountains. Uh, but there is very, very little um, research right now. So anyone who's pretty much smart as a scientist or as a, you know, a research hopeful in Bulgaria moves out to universities like this one or in Western Europe or elsewhere in the United States and in the world. Um, if you look at what these Bulgarian IT companies that employ 17,000 people are doing, very little of it is actually fundamental stuff. There are a couple of companies that are doing uh, uh, you know, hardcore te technological solutions, but most of it is, is relatively low-grade work. A lot of it is QA, a lot of it is uh, you know, feature requests, uh, support, and stuff like this. So with a pool of talent like that, it is very, very hard to get you know, the, the, necessary, um, the necessary vision, the necessary skill set for technological founders to, to, to exceed. And as, as I already said, the vast majority of the capital that is available um, is, is not extremely smart. It is basically government money to kickstart uh, kick an economy. Hopefully that will be successful, but at this moment it's, it's hard to say that a lot of that money is really smart. Um, so if you basically size that down, this whole story of you know, 110 companies, 80 million euros invested, if you size that down to what is a real addressable market in Bulgaria, um, I would say that there are probably five seed rounds a year where you know, private investors could participate in. That would make sense. There are probably two Series A rounds happening where uh, each year where you know private investor might might take a look uh, at, or I, I should probably say up to two. Sometimes it's very regular. Um, and if you look at exits, and generally they happen in Bulgaria once every two or three years, not not more often than that. Um, so for investors, consequently, it is a it is a, it is a challenge to to address that as a market. You know, simply as a market as a country, Bulgaria is rather small. Um, so if you're looking at investing in Bulgaria, that's something that I've been doing and trying to do for the last several years. Um, uh, you, need to, you need to actually expand your geography and keep Bulgaria as one of those targets. It's really uh, hard to focus only on Bulgaria as a country. Um, the other thing is as an investor, what you've got to do is you've got to increase the skill set. So you've got to help the founders with, that, with those business development skills, with those product skills, with, with that access to talent, which is simply not present in Bulgaria, um, and consequently connected to markets. Uh, which, which are markets where technology could be, um, could be um, used and engaged with uh, at an early stage. And this is what we do. So I've been, um, I've been running around the Bulgarian venture scene for the last several years. Uh, we've had a very good go with you know, setting up the scene, uh, launching the first accelerator programs, distributing some of the first seed checks. Um, right now what we're doing with my partner Vitaly, who's at the back, is we're launching um, a fund and an ecosystem building company for the entire Eastern European region. Uh, we are, you know, I'm personally very inclined and very happy to give back to Bulgaria, and we're trying to do as much as we can. But at the same time, we're looking at countries like Ukraine, like Romania, like Serbia, also like Turkey. We're also expanding, looking more and more in the Middle East. And we actually believe that Eastern Europe and the Middle East, this entire emerging region east of Western Europe, uh, as, as a whole, is an interesting market. And I think that in that region, Bulgaria definitely has a very, has a very good position. Uh, with CCC Startups, our company, just to give you a few slides, um, our aim is to become the main, uh, uh, the, the main ecosystem catalyst and invest in the best companies and the best deals that come out of that region. Um, for, 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 from an investment point of view, it makes a lot of sense. So if you look at, if you can compare European and American venture capital, um, uh, basically Europe produces uh, uh, half as many exits as the United States with only 20% of the venture capital. So. There are a lot of uh, misses, but if once you actually get to a hit, as an investor, it's very lucrative to be in one. And this is what drives um, you know, uh, the fund investors that we're talking to, the, the, some of the other early investors that already are active on the scene, like, for instance, the Irish fund that invested in Christie's company. Um, so that, 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 is, that is pretty much the game that we're playing. And once you actually manage to give returns, they will be, on average, higher than returns in the US, where the market is very efficient and very competitive. Um, to actually get to the, to, the, to the right kind of deals in Europe, to get to the good startups, uh, you need to do a lot of ecosystem building work, right? So you need to do a lot of community, uh, community focus. You need to bring content to startups. You need to use uh, existing skill sets to actually uh, verify and validate whether startups are doing the right thing. And that's something that we're doing with our, um, with our brand startup adventure where we're building communities all across the region. We just had a series of events that we did across the Middle East um, in Cairo, in Baku, Azerbaijan, in, um, in Turkey. 
uh, we're expanding, uh, we're continuing with this tour in April to, with a number of Eastern European countries, um, Hungary, Croatia, Poland. Um, and we'll be back in Bulgaria uh, with an event sometime soon, hopefully this year as well. Uh, this is our team. Uh, Vitaly is sitting there in the back. This is me. I already told you my story. And our third partner is Mike Reiner, who was also one of the um, one of the uh, how do you call that? One of the early early actors on the European uh, on the Eastern European um, startup scene. He was a founder of a, a relatively well performing um, accelerator in Estonia. So we have some friends from Estonia who, of course, know Startup Wise Guys. Um, three of us are pushing this effort together. Now, what I wanted to leave you guys with is you know, some ideas on what you, know, what you can do with Bulgaria, right? Because uh, for those of you that are not of Bulgarian heritage or have never been to Bulgaria, you know, what, how, what, is, what is the value of a place like Bulgaria for Silicon Valley? Um, first of all, because of this um, push you know, to set up a startup community and a venture community in the last couple of years, we actually have a large number of people uh, vast majority, you know, I, I dare to say that with failed startups, either startups that are on their way to fail out or that have already failed, that actually have startup experience, that actually went through, um, through a round of venture financing, that actually went through a, uh, a finished you know, product prototype. And uh, this number of people is approximately, I mean, I said 500 plus, but this is, you know, if you include all the employees of all these companies, this is up to 1,000 people, only in Bulgaria, that actually have experience in early experience in startups and also hunger for success and for further achievements in the, in the startup world. So these are people that you can engage with. They are not expensive. They are very, very eager. Um, that's generally what sets Europe apart. People are, the ones that are hungry are generally very hungry. Um, if you're an experienced operator in Silicon Valley, um, you have a huge advantage uh, of adding business development, product, market development skills to uh, teams with interesting technology or interesting product potential in Eastern Europe that do not have those skills. So, uh, you know, as, as, someone, um, as someone who has been through a several startups or several interesting product companies in Silicon Valley, simply by going to a place like Bulgaria and, and looking, you know, for, for the most interesting startups locally, this could deliver a lot of uh, interesting potential and interesting work in a place that is totally off the beaten track. Um, finally, if you're, if you're an investor, as I already mentioned, um, Funds like ours are on the lookout for the, for the best performing deals. Um, and you have the opportunity to invest with a much higher um, average chance of return than in Western European or American um, startup investments. Um, so this is pretty much it for me. Um, together with my partner Ellie, we'll be on Saturday at South by Southwest. So if anyone is there, we'll be giving another talk there, not so much about Bulgaria, but about the entire uh, European accelerator ecosystem and how startups that are accelerated in Europe you know, differ from what you see in the United States. So join us on Saturday morning. Uh, if you're there, you just Google my name on South by Southwest. You'll, on, on the schedule, you'll, you'll find it. And uh, that is it for me. Thank you very much for being here. And Thank thanks for having me. Questions? Yes, in the back. Make no mistake, if you're in Bulgaria, it doesn't feel that way. But I think that you should probably also mention, because it's a very interesting, interesting economic paradox, that 93% of the population in Bulgaria owns at least one piece of real property, which is yeah. there, and it's only 10%, so you can't compete with that. So the GDP is a little bit, for me specifically, it's misleading, because especially for trying to attract foreign investment, yeah. I think it's worth mentioning. I mean, Bulgaria is a beautiful place. If you visit Bulgaria, you wouldn't get the feeling that it's one of the first countries in the European Union. And also... Do you have a question, ma'am? Yeah, I do. I wanted to see, okay. um, because the corporate tax rate in Bulgaria is 10%, so I wanted to see how that interplays with attractive... <coughs> I'm, I'm sorry, could you repeat that, please? Corporate tax rate in Bulgaria. It is very low, yeah. So the corporate tax rate in Bulgaria is only 10%. So Bulgaria is generally very, very lax on taxes. Uh, which makes it a very nice place to live if you have, uh, you know, if you're doing something. That's what I always tell people, if you're doing something sensible, uh, Bulgaria is a very good place to be based at because we, indeed we have 10% personal income tax and 10% corporate tax, which makes it very low. So that is true, yes. I just, I, I was just, I just, just before uh, Titus asked a question, um, uh, I just looked up there is a purchasing parity um, per capita as well, which should take, you know, stuff like real estate into account, but it's still very low. It's around 14,000 US dollars. But Thank it you. is low, yes. Yes, sir. Good question. How are you pricing political risk, especially with um, the situation in uh, Ukraine and uh, Russia um, 
doing things to its neighbors? That is a very good question, Nathan Titus. Thank you. Um, you know, nominally, the story is very simple. Bulgaria is a member of the European Union and it's a member of NATO. So Article 5 of NATO protects Bulgaria if Russia would invade. The United States is obliged by law to send its army. And actually, the U United States Air Force is based in Bulgaria at uh, one air base and at what weapons depot. So theoretically, I mean, I remember last year, Bert and I had this conversation uh, where he asked me in late February of last year, do you think Russia would invade Ukraine? And I remember we were sitting at a restaurant in Palo Alto uh, two weeks before it happened. And I, and I told Burton, like, no way, that's impossible, unthinkable in our times. And then it happened, right? So um, you, it's, it's very hard to predict whether it would happen or not. Uh, but uh, for the, you know, Bulgaria, more than most other Eastern European countries, because of European Union membership, because of NATO membership, is probably on the safer side. But of course, you never know. Uh, George. Have, uh, first of all, I would like to thank you. I mean, your presentation was valid for Romania, so everything is absolutely parallel. Thank you. What I would like to ask you, because I, I put myself a question, what was the trigger which made actually the entrepreneurial <coughs> movement to go on the side? Bulgaria went up, Romania stayed the same way. I know yeah. the governments are different, but what's that? Yeah. This is a very interesting question, and this is something that I hear a lot, especially from Romanians. You know, how come Bulgaria went up and Romania stayed the same? Uh, I think that what you're referring to is this, uh, uh, you know, burst of European funding for startups. Because I think that in, in other terms, uh, it's, it's either comparable or probably even in some terms, if you look at the number of companies that have offices in Romania, globally significant IT companies, if you even look at the number of exits, maybe not the total volume, because obviously Telerik was a huge exit story, but if you look at the number of exit events, probably Romania would score higher. And it probably that's not very strange because it is by population three times larger than Bulgaria. Uh, but if you're referring to this burst of, uh, of EU funding that is available in Bulgaria, uh, that probably has to do with politics. So at the time when those funds were set up, they were tendered for the first time in 2010. Uh, the fund tenders actually happened in 2011 and the closings of the funds occurred in 2012. At that time, Bulgaria had a government which uh, it's pretty much the same government as right now. Uh, uh, very corrupt and very, very shady in many ways. But one of the things that they did is that they needed pro-European success stories to be able to negotiate and get leverage from, uh, from Brussels. And they used the opportunity to set up this venture ecosystem uh, as, as one of those. So it was, it was a moment. After that, a government, there was a, uh, um, uh, a pro-Russian kind of left-leaning, if, if you can call it that way, government in Bulgaria that was very much against this whole startup scene. Uh, but for a very brief you know, window in time, uh, we were just lucky. Um, and I know that in Romania, the EIF, the European Investment Fund office that was trying to do the same, simply wasn't, you know, wasn't able to execute the same. So it was it's political chance and moment, moment, momentum, yeah. Question. Yes, sir. Oh, yes, sir. Yes. What, what, is, what is the solution for Bulgaria? There are a couple of problems like the problem <laughs> like the That's a very good question. What is the solution for Bulgaria? I, I, would, I have no clue, sir. I don't know. Um, you know, if, if there is one thought that I didn't actually share in the presentation is I, I personally think that it's very, very hard to set up technology ecosystems in European countries without a very large um, political or maybe societal push for, uh, you know, for, for demand for technologies, right? So if you look at the history of Silicon Valley, if you look at the history of the, you know, what is considered to be the second best performing technology ecosystem in the world, which is Israel, um, if you look at the history there, there were usually very high societal problems which the government was determined to resolve through technology, right? So in the US, it was the arms race, the space race. That was the reason originally money started pouring into places like MIT and Stanford for, for technology development. Then some of that started spilling over into the private sector, right? Um, I think personally, and this is my personal opinion, that for Europe to become a real powerhouse in technology, something like that would be needed on a European level. You know, and where Bulgaria would be in that equation, you know, is up to Bulgarians. But uh, that is not yet happening. I'm sorry? In, in, you know, th that is another thing, right? So as long as the European markets are as segregated as they are today, and with Bulgaria being a national little market, with, which is worth almost nothing, uh, it is unrealistic. Uh, maybe one day Bulgaria will become a blooming market and will support technology, but that is very far away. Christy, can we get you up here now? Next, yeah. next to Max. Do you want me to switch back to this? Let's day? see. Val, hold on. Let me see if anyone else has a question who hasn't asked one before. Julius. Uh, I'm Julius from Switzerland, and I thank you for reading. So Julius is the former... General Consul for Switzerland up until a few months ago. And you've, you've returned to Switzerland, Thank was that you. December? I'm here for wine country and civic <laughs> Yes, OK. Very good. But I'm always very intrigued about the source of funding. And uh, I believe I have heard from Max that there is a lot of public funding. In, in obviously, uh, yeah, that's, of course, understandable. 
I believe, I believe it's very interesting you said, I think you have established your own or a private venture capital fund for Eastern Europe. Mm -hmm. Would that have been private money? That, that is what we're working on right now. So we haven't, we haven't gotten to first closing yet, but we're, we're working on it. And that would be a fund with mostly, you know, we'll probably have uh, several, uh, one or two maybe institutional checks, but it would mostly be private capital, yes. Thank you. Thank you. Val. Yeah, um, similar question about your future kind of activities in the investment company. Um, uh, when we are witnessing this tragic situation, Russia is invading Ukraine. And uh, I, my question is, uh, I mean, this is very bad, but do you see opportunity in this situation mm -hmm. somehow to enhance the business, create new opportunities? Yeah. I'm going to take this one. Yeah, please. Yeah, Go ahead. Um, yeah, so for us, it was we are always hunting engineers. So uh, obviously, we thought about this uh, when it comes to Ukraine. So uh, try to move some uh, uh, Ukrainian engineers back to Bucharest. Um, unfortunately, that's not very uh, likely to happen since most of the Ukrainians are uh, engineers are moving to UK or Germany. So it's um, uh, probably uh, I would say exotic countries like Romania and Bulgaria are not so w driven when it comes to bringing external uh, engineers. So if that answers your question more or less, you have anything to add? Yeah, you know, uh, that is, uh, I guess I agree with Christy on, on that, you know, scale of, 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 of you know, defining the problem. Um, I think the positive thing that could come from security risks, um, and one thing that you're, for instance, seeing right now in Ukraine, so, uh, you know, both Vitaly and I uh, are very engaged with Ukraine. You know, we, uh, we visit it very often. We do startup events there. We've uh, worked with a lot of startups in and from Ukraine. Uh, one of the very exciting things that we're seeing right now is that um, there is, for instance, a surge in drone uh, development in Ukraine because that is something that the Ukrainian uh, National Army obviously needs. Uh, they, they need basically low-cost, cheap weapon systems that can help them in, uh, to defend their country. Uh, so probably in the longer run, you will see, uh, f f with those people that actually stay back home, you will see a specialization of that kind of technology. Um, and again, ver as very similarly to Israel, uh, if, that, you know, if that security situation continues to be bad over enough you know, period of time, um, and you don't scare all the engineers off, the ones that will stay will actually probably become pretty good. It will develop technology that, that will, um, you know, that will, uh, that will be fundamental for solving that country's, that, that country's needs. So that's one way to jumpstart your inner market is to have a war on your doorstep, yeah. where the government has to step in and yeah, buy, buy much like America and, back in the day. Yeah. Right. Sorry, Ken. We have a question back here from one of our Finnish colleagues. Yeah. Uh, about the Romania. Um, you said you have a lot of R&D uh, people in Romania concerning the game sector. Do you got uh, any kind of like goodwill startup community uh, like built after that? Because that that's sorry, sorry, I, I'm, I have to ask you to repeat the question. There was a lot of background noise. Uh, kind of like a startup goodwill community. I mean that uh, supports new startups or, or gaming companies, like small gaming companies. Because that's a huge thing in Finland. I mean, after Robio and Supercell, I mean, we get a lot of support from big companies I mean, when, when they uh, organize. So um, Finland is the unicorn, like, no, not the unicorn, like a herd of unicorns, you know, like, you um, oh, just to put things into context, Finland, uh, where the guys, um, where Rovio started uh, with Angry Birds, Angry Birds uh, was the game that pretty much <laughs> helped everybody uh, in the world to use a smartphone at the end of the day. And after that, when there was, uh, everybody was saying like, oh, that's not going to happen again, uh, comes Supercell. Supercell is uh, by far the largest uh, uh, mobile gaming company in the world. Uh, the previous uh, uh, the previous uh, round that they've raised, I think it was at the valuation of three million, three billion dollars, and uh, that was uh, yeah, like two years ago. So probably right now we're looking at about a, a five million or even a ten million a billion dollar company. Um, what's happening in your country? not necessarily uh, scales to other countries as well. So uh, everybody knows Finland as being the largest, uh, the most successful country when it comes to game development, especially mobile game development. Um, and that's when you see this sort of synergy between indie game developers uh, that are starting out and existing big gaming companies. 
We don't have the same here, mainly because there weren't any success stories. Uh, so I don't know if that answers your question more or less. Yeah, well, well, in a way, I mean, you're experienced. Uh, well, you've done one gaming company already. Yeah. I mean, should people come to you or, or, or ask how, how should you work? I mean, Oh, uh, so um, the question was if, uh, since we have already um, started a gaming company and we're already on the market for three years, are new uh, indie developers coming to us asking for advice and so on? I, I would have to say there, there are a few, not as many as I would hoped. Um, we sort of have this tendency where we believe that we can do a better thing our, on our own rather than asking for advice. But that's starting to change a little bit. You know, I think you're nodding probably. Oh, yeah, totally. That's a very Eastern European thing, yeah. I would say, yeah. Uh, just let me add so that the gaming market, the demand for gaming, is one of the few areas where Europe does have a strong domestic market across Europe, where there are early adopters uh, in Europe. And so this is one of the reasons why gaming has been very important for the job growth in the IT sector in Europe, including deep Eastern Europe, like Belarus. Uh, <laughs> because they've been able to find local, con local consumers online relatively easily over and over and over again. And that's what makes gaming quite different from many, uh, many of the other startup sectors we've featured here. Let's see, there was some d someone down here, Ken, uh, and then you, sir, and then I think we'll wrap it up after that. Just, just real quick for both of you, because I've, you know, I've had experience with a lot of different entrepreneurs, specifically in India and Southeast Asia. What I was interested in knowing from the both of you what kind of percentage does of the of the equity does the investment take pre Series A? Pre Series A. Is it country to country or deal to deal? But <coughs> I mean, I know that in some other regions of the world, they they they, they take the first board. Yeah. I mean, they really take a lot of it. Yeah. <laughs> I guess the I mean, if, if I may first, yeah, uh, ahead, the um, you know the, scarcity, right? there the, there are two so there are two things to play here. Um, uh, first of all uneducated investors, so when the community is not really developed, you generally see, um, I remember for instance there's a country of uh, the Republic of Moldova, I hope there's no one from there today to be offended, but I remember when I first visited it in 2012, um, I remember meeting pretty much the only local angel investor who told me like, uh, who told me when I, you know, we were talking about a couple of local startups, he told me, yeah, of course I'm gonna take more than 50% because I'm putting all, in, all the money, right? So why, why would I take any less, right? They're not doing anything, I'm just giving all the money to them, right? And I tried to kind of explain to him that in the world that generally doesn't work. But he was, he was convinced that in Moldova that would work. Funnily enough, I was back in Moldova in February, uh, or in the Republic of Moldova, I should say, and uh, interestingly enough, uh, that seems to change there as well. So there is a difference between the, you know, the educational level of a market. And also in Bulgaria, three, four years ago, when I started doing stuff there, that was kind of the perception. Now, when you look at the markets that already are connected to you know, the global way of doing things, um, generally, the, the percentages are more or less the same. What are different are the valuations, right? So you would see a company with, you know, with revenues uh, or with a pipeline uh, of millions, you know, being valued at let's say one or two or three million dollars, whereas something like that in, in Silicon Valley would be valued ten times more. So there is a difference there. The bite sizes for investors are pretty much the same. It's you know, less than ten percent for accelerators. You know, up to ten, fifteen maybe for seed investors, and around twenty, twenty-five for Series A. It's it's the same. Um, so I I personally, when we started uh, raising capital, we heard some really horror stories in the past 10 years, like 50%, uh, 60% uh, seed investments, uh, companies that at the end of the day, they just simply uh, died because there was no one else to pour in capital. Um, that change, I haven't heard any of that horror stories in the past uh, couple of years. I'm really happy. And more or less, it's in the same line, just Max, like Max said, uh, 10, 50% at most probably, but the valuation is not this good. Yes, sir, last question. Okay, so first of all, thanks for sharing the stories. Um, my question for, for both guests, um, what would you say is the biggest lesson learned for you in, for Christian, in, in uh, building Maven Hut and for you in investing in Bulgaria? And what would you change if, if you have to do it all over? That's a very good last question, is it? You go first. <laughs> uh, I'll give you a second. Uh, can you go first? I did not think that's... Uh, uh, right, give me a second. <laughs> Um, I don't know, for me, the, the biggest lesson learned probably is that uh, old habits are, uh, you know, die hard uh, when there isn't a culture for, so 
I mean, the reason things work, let's say in Silicon Valley is a very good example, the way they work is because there are several generations of experience of doing things a certain way, and actually there is, there is reward, right? So companies are bu being built successfully. Um, to give you a very simple example, and that kind of relates also to a question which was posed, I think, in the beginning about uh, equity, right? So how, how companies are being, um, how, how do you reward employees? Um, a very simple thing, you know, a friend of mine recently told me a story how he went back to his place somewhere in San Francisco and he saw that the neighbors, you know, had fully redecorated their house, bought a new car and everything else. And then he, you know, he heard the story that apparently the lady there uh, in the house, and she, you know, their first immigration, first generation immigrants, um, she was working as an office manager in a major Silicon Valley company that went public, right? And they, and, and that kind of stories inspire other people, it spills over. You, you see that if you're a first generation immigrant uh, working a, an office manager job, you can actually profit from your company going public, you know, a technology company. That kind of stories do not exist in places like Bulgaria. So uh, to actually instill into people um, um, the belief, you know, to take those crazy risks to do technology startups without, you know, being, seeing around how you're being rewarded for that because no one ever gets to that, that's the hard part. And that dies hard and it usually, it will take a generation or two for, um, for people to get used to that if things develop in the right way. Um, so, you know, <laughs> going back to your, to your next question of what, what I would do differently, the question that everyone has to ask themselves is, are you going to be patient enough and are you interested in sticking around to seeing that happen? Uh, I'm still answering that with a yes, but it's a question that we, you know, me and my partners, we discuss every day. Yeah. But you're also hedging your bets. In a way, yeah. I mean, in the, in, it's, it's like with real estate, right? You know that in 50 years it will be worth more, that's for sure, but will it in 10 years, right? So, <laughs> Christy, final, any final words? Um, I think probably I would have to say that one of the things that I have learned and one of the things that I would do differently is thinking big about the business. Uh, there were times that uh, I said to myself, oh, this is not going to get any big bigger than that. That's pretty much it. The next, the, the next month it doubled. Uh, okay, that's it. Now, come on, really. Come on, stop it. No, the next month doubled. And that happened like four or five times. Um, and looking back, I really took like some really crappy decisions based on uh, that mindset, uh, based on the mindset that the growth is gonna stop at some point. Um, fortunately for us, uh, right now we are uh, about two and a half years since uh, we flashed our very first product. It is still growing, so uh, it pretty much says a lot regarding what were the risks that we have taken in the past. So we've played it safe, um, and. Um, I would have to say that thinking about it in a very, very, um, think about it as a, uh, something that is going to get really big. I would change that about uh, pretty much about all Eastern Europeans because I've seen that as well. And, and maybe just a final thing, the thing that I would, you know, if I would do it again, you know, if I'm going to be founding a tech company, I would definitely do it in Bulgaria because now I know how it works. <laughs> <laughs> so thank you both very much. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you for having us. Thank you so much. Thank you very thank much. You so much. Max, thank you very much. Thank you. Thanks so much. Um, just a quick short announcement. Our next session will be in January of 2016. Uh, so please join us for year eight. In the meantime, I'd like to thank all the Stanford students who've enrolled in this course, who make this course possible, as well as the many course speakers who have flown in for Europe over and over again. We could not do this without their support. Uh, along with the Silicon Valley community, the investor community, consulting, European government community. And finally, and f they're not here, but part of the teaching team, Lars and Gerald, without whom I could not run this course. So many thanks to all of you for coming each week. We appreciate that. And please come down and meet the speakers, and we hope to see you next year. Thank you. <laughs>